Good. Hi, good evening or good afternoon if you're on the West Coast. Um, I'm John McAuliffe, the coordinator of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee and the director of the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. Uh, this is one of some 20 webinars that we have produced that are trying to bring the history of the U.S. movement against the war in Indochina uh, into people's homes and bring the activists to meet both members of our own generation and later generations. Uh, a couple of protocol things, just so you know how this is working. We have the chat off at this point. We'll turn it on when we get to this discussion stage so it's not interrupting the presentations. Also, if you have questions, please use the Q&A system. Don't put questions on the chat because they won't be seen there. Use the Q&A. Um, if you are somebody that worked with IMEP at the grassroots, uh, send me a chat. Um, you can do that at, actually at any point. You can chat to the speakers um, and we'll try and work you in in the discussion. Um, when this program is finished, probably tomorrow sometime, uh, you will get a link to a recording of it. It'll be on YouTube so that you can look at it again and share it with people. Um, we have, say, many, many programs online already, and we hope you, you get a chance to look through all of them. Um, when we at this time that I post or the day after I post the uh, YouTube that you'll be notified of, we'll try and get the chat and the Q&A posted so that you don't have to write notes down from that. So I want to introduce Brewster Rhodes, who is moderating this program, and I will disappear from the screen. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, John. I uh, appreciate all you do for Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. My name is Brewster Rhodes. I live in Cincinnati um, and I'm uh, a member of the steering committee um, with John of Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. Um, and I'm going to be your moderator tonight. I think we'll have a lively discussion uh, with folks who've had firsthand experience traveling all over the country from 71 to 76 with the Indochina Mobile Education Project. It's a unique grassroots operation and, um, uh, and, and really was very impactful and successful in carrying the message about what was going on in Indochina from people who have first, firsthand experience uh, to the grassroots of this country. So we'll discuss um, you know, what the Indochina Mobile Education was, how it got started, what it did, how it was organized, who it reached, how it motivated people to take action and what lessons could be learned for activists today. So by way of introduction, IMEP, this is information that's on the website there, played a key role in educating people in communities throughout America about war damage, damages, and the human impacts of U.S. military intervention in Vietnam and Laos. In other, uh, its other purpose was to highlight an estimated 200,000 political prisoners held by uh, the U.S.-funded Saigon regime and to encourage letters to Congress to reduce U.S. military and police aid. Uh, from the fall of 1971 through 1976, following the end of the war, IMEP toured the country with large photo exhibits, films, slideshows, and educational materials designed to help citizens understand the toll of the war. Two people who had experienced the war as soldiers, humanitarian agency volunteers, or journalists traveled with each exhibit, visiting hundreds of communities in every state, making thousands of presentations to churches and synagogues, civic organizations, schools, and fraternal groups like Lions and Kiwanis Clubs. At each stop, IMEP introduced audiences to Vietnamese food and music. People were encouraged to reach out to their elected officials to call for an end to U.S. military aid and, Sa and Saigon's repressive government. Um, Ambassador Graham Martin reported to Congress in 1976 that the Indochina Resource Center and its offspring, the Indochina Mobile Education Project, had carried on, quote, one of the best propaganda and pressure campaigns the world has ever seen. So our panel tonight features people who travel the country as IMEP organizers and tour speakers, as well as some of us who hosted the project in our own communities. Um, 
there's a detailed bio about each of our wonderful panelists uh, on the website. Uh, but let's start with a quick round of introductions. So let's start just one minute there, Willie, uh, take it away. Let us know who you are. Hi, I'm Willie Myers, and I'm going to be a prequel to IMEP. I'll tell you more about that later, but um, I'm uh, now a retired professor from University of Missouri. I went to Vietnam as IBS in 19 June of 63, and I was there uh, for two years, came back as a recruitment officer for IBS for a year, and then one of our uh, team leaders was uh, tragically killed in Vietnam, Pete uh, Hunting. And uh, I went and took his place in the summer of um, 66. And then I resigned in protest against the war in August of 67 and came back to DC. And I'll tell more about that story later, but later I became an academic and Pretty much, I was at Iowa State for a while, at FAO in Rome for a while, at the University of Missouri, uh, where I still am, kind of retired. Thank you, Will. Oh, thank you very much. Wonderful to have you here. Sally Benson. Take it away, Sally. You're on mute. Okay, well, there you go. So, yes, so I was born in New England here, and I served as an English teacher in Vietnam, 1967-1968, with International Voluntary Services. Steve Nichols and I lived for quite a few years in Washington, D.C., involved with organizations that were related to Vietnam and the post-war uh, situation. Um, we now live with our family in Steve's hometown in California, and we manage a small foundation that supports post-war uh, issues having to, like Agent Orange and Unexploded Ordinance. Thank you, Sally. Wonderful. And uh, are you not on a boat off of Martha's Vineyard? <laughs> <laughs> so I know. Wonderful. I'm missing a lobster lunch. Uh, wonderful to have you call in here today. So let's Thank move on. You. To nice to see everybody. Great. To, um, Jackie Shanyun. Jackie, take it away. You're on mute. Good evening, everybody. Um, I first went to Vietnam in um, uh, 1968, just after the Tet Offensive. Uh, I really didn't know what I was doing, but I managed to get a job with IVS, International Voluntary Service, for some time. Um, I worked a lot on, on trying to understand, um, A, the Vietnamese language, and B, the, the desires of Vietnamese themselves. Um, and when I returned home, it was Christmas, um, and uh, three years later, uh, and I wanted to, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> I was so upset about the war. But I, I finally uh, decided um, when Don Luce, who many of you might recommend know, um, he, he called me at Christmas Eve and said, Jackie, I need you to come to Washington right away. And I said, what for? And he said, I'll tell you when you get here. <laughs> and that began the routine issue. Uh, so I worked with the mobile project uh, for um, almost 10 years. <laughs> and then, and so now I'm um, also very active uh, still in Laos and Vietnam and Cambodia. Thank you, Jackie. Wonderful. Bob Chenoweth, you're on mute. Great. Hi. My name is Bob Chenoweth. Uh, I was born in Portland, Oregon, 1947. In 1966, I finished high school, enlisted in the Army, uh, went to basic training at uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana, and then on to helicopter school at uh, Fort Rucker, Alabama. In January of 67, I went to Vietnam and I flew as a helicopter crew chief for almost a year. 
Uh, in December of 67, I extended my tour in Vietnam for six months. I went home on leave, came back in January of 68. On February 8th of 68, my helicopter was shot down in Quang Tri province. And I started uh, five years of captivity in starting in the northern part of South Vietnam and then ending up finally in Hanoi. Uh, I came home in March of 1973. And uh, because of what I had learned about the war and because of uh, what was still going on in Vietnam, uh, I teamed up with various anti-war organizations and people and just tried to add my voice to the to the effort to finally bring the war to an end, to stop the funding and, you know, get all the political prisoners released. So. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. We'll be hearing from you and everybody else momentarily in more detail. Judy Danielson, introduce yourself. You're on mute. There you go. Um, hi, I am Judy. I worked in Vietnam from 1968 to 70 as a physical therapist. I was in Saigon, which is now Ho Chi Minh City, uh, at a rehab center set up by the United States government. Um, we treated a lot of amputees. I was not very happy in this government setting, and I went up and visited the Quakers in Guangai and uh, because they had their own rehab center and uh, learned a lot more about the war when I was outside the city. I uh, saw a lot of the bombing and strafing going on and the wounded and uh, dead coming into the hospitals. And um, I came back quite upset. I had helped Don Luce with the uh, find the tiger cages. And I came up very, very upset about the war. I worked a little bit with the American Friends Service Committee doing some speaking, but I said settled in Denver and worked with clergy and lady concerned in the American Friends Service Committee here and uh, helped with organizing. So um, glad to have everyone here and to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Appreciate it. And so just to wrap up, I'm Brewster Rhodes. I live in Cincinnati, born and raised in Philadelphia, and was an a interwar activist in high school and college and hosted the uh, IMEP tour in, uh, in 1974 in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And I'll be sharing that in a little bit, but I've been a political activist and do, running political campaigns and nonprofit environmental organizations um, for a long time. So uh, it's wonderful to be part of this. So moving right along here, uh, what we'd like to do now is to have each of our panelists, starting with Willie. Um, I've asked everybody to start off with a, a short overview of how they came to be associated with the organization and what role they played uh, with the project and any stories they wanna share about their experiences on the road in the office or as hosts in their community. So Willie, we'll start with you and we'll try to keep this to five or eight minutes at max, five, six minutes at the most. Okay, thank you. You're on mute. At Will, you're on mute still. Okay, I'm back. Good. Now you're great. Sounds Let great. Let me share a couple of slides. And um, uh, hopefully this will... I'm trying to find the... Uh, where is that thing now? There you go. Okay. So uh, I mentioned that uh, I resigned uh, from IBS in protest against the war in August of 67. And uh, in September, we, uh, Don Luce and Gene Solsfus and Don Ronk and I, who were all leaders in IBS Vietnam, um, organized this um, open letter to President Johnson and uh, it got pretty good publicity. There were 50 IVSers that signed the letter uh, 
and seven of us left, uh, re uh, resigned. We encouraged volunteers to stay and continue their good work. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what else they did there. But uh, the idea was for Don and Jean and I and Don Runk, uh, who stayed in Vietnam as a journalist, all to work on um, giving better information about what was going on in Vietnam that we felt the American people were were not uh, were not getting. And I mentioned this is uh, Sally will know more about how this was connected with IMEP. So I'm not going to go into that because she knows more about that transition. But we went to Washington, D.C. and uh, we were hosted and, and supported and financed by the Methodist Church. If you're all Methodist, you should give a clap uh, to the Methodist Church for this support. It was the Board of Christian Social Concerns, the Women's Division, and the Board of General uh, General Board of Missions who supported us. Rodney Shaw was the guy in charge of that, and we landed in D.C. and uh, they uh, we didn't know anything about about talking to Congress or any of that stuff, you know. So uh, the the Rodney Shaw and also the people from the Friends National uh, Committee on Legislation and also from SANE, the, the uh, uh, Committee for uh, SANE Nuclear Policy, you might, some of you who are older might remember that, um, all helped us to organize meetings with uh, Congress and with journalists and other things that would help get out the message. So um, the open letter got got promoted, but also the 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 work in Congress uh, was organized. Don Luce, this is a picture of him when he was testifying before the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, William uh, Senator Fulbright was chair at that time, and he organized a lot of contacts for us with senators. We had a lunch with all the senators and his committee, and this testimony got a lot of um, publicity. Um, and also, um they organized meetings with members of congress uh both senators and 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 members of congress uh to talk to them and it was quite um an opportunity to give them the real story about what was happening in vietnam uh compared with what they were hearing you know from official sources um there was um there were briefings for people like uh, George H.W. Bush, who was going to be at now on a fact-finding mission. George Romney, those of you who are older might remember, he came back and said he was brainwashed by the government, and that probably didn't help his campaign very much for the presidency. But anyway, the IBSers who stayed in Vietnam were were there to help. In, when these people got there, we were organizing meetings between them and, and the IBSers to give them more information. Uh, also, they were trying to get us to meet um, McNamara. We got to see Cyrus Vance, and he said, I have this thing up here for a reason. He said we should write up our story and give it, and then he could try to get us in to see McNamara. Well, the people in, in FCNL advised us not to give this to the Pentagon because they might classify it and nobody else would be able to see it. So we instead gave it to the uh, Senator Morton, who put it in the congressional record, and it had uh, uh, also a um, a support from Senator Kennedy, who was also a big a big uh, supporter of of our efforts. So um, the other thing that was going here was the newsletter that was really used uh, mostly to give IBSers who were still in Vietnam. In, uh, opportunities to tell their stories and to send their stories. And this was, I don't know what the circulation was. I don't remember at all, but um, this is one way to get the get the word out. And also Gene Stolzfus and Don went around the country, did a lot of speaking. Uh, I didn't do that very much, uh, but I was organizing their trips. And once in a while, uh, I would take up one in around DC. I remember I had a I had a little debate with John Negroponte at a Methodist church in Washington, D.C. one time. 
but um, most of the time they were the ones going out to speak and I was organizing things in DC. Also, uh, you may know about the book that John, uh, that Don wrote with John Summer later on and, and other uh, kinds of ways that uh, this came out a little bit later. And you probably also know, uh, I was already mentioned about Don taking the uh, Senator Harkin to the tiger cages in Vietnam. So I'm just going to stop there and we'll go back to other things that you might want to ask about later. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Uh, Appreciate it. Very much. Sharing. So, Sally, you're up. You're on mute. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I came into this a little bit late and very appreciative of what Willie and Jean Stolzis and Don did to get this whole project on the road and going. But I was working with Fred Branfman in the room next door. Uh, I was helping with Project Air War, which was, had to do with the secret war of the bombing of Laos. And I met, was in the room next door, and I, uh, and as you, Willie, suggested, it really started with their going to the hill and then getting around and and when Jean, when Don was kicked out of Vietnam in 1971, his students said, "When you, you've got to go home and tell the American people that we are people too, and we're not just uh, war statistics for the TV news." Um, anyway. Um, How to get how to get to the American people face to face? So Jean uh, found a used BNBW van, and and um, he yeah he was really the first coordinator, and then it's just somehow a seemingly miraculous how this con coming together of young people with skills and talent and a great passion for what was going on with the Vietnam War, a very strong moral compass about, about it. Um, so one of those people was Mac Turner, who had carpentry skills, and he took um, 10, eight by 10 sheets of plywood and created uh, what was in effect 20 back-to-back -back panels on which to put the mobile project. And it would be folded, he did it so it could be folded to fit into the VW van. He later did another huge exhibit for a Dodge van and a small uh, shippable visit uh, exhibit it was useful to get to Alaska and Vietnam. So in effect, the mobile project was in every state of the country. Um, at some point, uh, Jean Stolzis went to seminary and, and Don Luce moved to New York City and Mac was becoming quite burned out and he begged me to take, uh, take on the coordination of the project. So it was like jumping into the fire. I mean. It, was totally new experience for me. Um, but I would contact peace organizations, chaplains, um, would put the exhibit and the team out on the road with a full uh, faith and hope. And they too were sort of going into the, you know, jumping into the fire as it were. Um, But being in the office and being the coordinator, I, it was it was really quite an experience. One, I, re, I mean, very quickly, I got a call. I'm going to die in the hills of in the mountains of West Virginia. It, it was snowing, and the person driving didn't seem, according to that person, wasn't driving very well. And then uh, 
a second situation in the office was I would get a call wanting to know where to send personal items that had been left in somebody's bed somewhere, and I'm not going to say what state. Um, another experience was the van was broken into. It was on its way. I was quite sick, and I was operating the mobile project out of my bed on the third floor of Best Street. And the van was heading for New England, for New England towns and colleges. And the van was broken into in New York City. The films were stolen. And the wine bottles into which had been decanted Nook Mom were stolen. So we all had a little laugh thinking about people glugging, uh, thinking they were getting wine and they're getting fermented fish sauce. Well, that was not quite sure. I don't know who was, I don't remember who was on that New England trip, but it had to have been hard because they were missing a lot of what they needed for their job. Um, once Jean-Pierre Debris was with the project, which was a great plus because of his experience, um, experiences in the Chihuahua prison, the notorious Chihuahua prison, I would get calls from young women wanting to know where Jean-Pierre was, you know, the, the charming Frenchman. And I also got calls from the mothers of young women calling me wanting to know where Jean-Pierre was. It was, uh, it, it, it was a lot of work, but it was also fun and funny, and, and that's how that was. Um, anyway, let's, let's go. Well, I was good. I was going to say, you know, we had, we, not only was Matt Turner putting together the exhibit, but Don and Holmes Brown put, to, you know, accumulated statistics of the 200, assumed 200,000 political prisoners available statistics and um, material. This would go out with the project. Um, Jean-Pierre's and, and uh, Moreau's book, We Accuse of Their Experience in the Chihuahua Prison, would go, went out with every, you know, with every tour. Um, and as Bob mentioned, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, has been mentioned, one of the purposes was to highlight the political prisoner uh, campaign. So we, we published a prayer book, for example, that had um, the president of the United Methodist Council of Bishops, Rabbi Mirsky of the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, the Reverend Brian Heyer of U.S. Catholic Conference, um, the General Secretary of the World Council of Churches. I mean, this little thing that we published went everywhere. There was a Mennonite, a Mennonite study, like a prayer study program, um, releases from bondage. Six days in the Vietnamese prison. This would go with the project. Um, Forgotten prisoners of of Nguyen Van Chu by a group of French university professors. Um, Jean Schaefer and Don and Jackie Chagnon and Don Luce put together a a book of poetry. This is the second of two editions. Of quiet courage, um, and somebody has already suggested that we went into the year after the end of the war, where we had uh, material. This one, the time to heal. Um, forget who did this. The Indochina Resource Center and Universal Unconditional Amnesty. Uh, so these, all of these things, plus uh, 
cultural artifacts like um, crafts made from the brass uh, uh, mortar shells, uh, purses made by the wires from the McNamara line, aluminum jewelry from downed airplanes. All these things went on a table. The literature, the crafts, um, and then we had a, a rotating carousel that had constantly going slideshows about what was going on in Laos and in Vietnam. Um, Good. It reached a lot of people, a lot of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Sally, just uh, restate the tour of the, uh, the Indochina Mobile Education Project ended up having a presence in 50 states, correct? All 50 states that the, the one we or believe more. Of the, so. yeah. Yep. Fantastic. No, we, uh, Mac had put together a, a small exhibit that could be shipped. Yep. And I don't know, maybe Jackie knows, but the um, at least that small exhibit went to Alaska and Hawaii. And I forget whether a van went, but as you know, our, our office was firebombed. So all the records of personnel, all the records of, of the tours and um, the newspaper articles was destroyed. Yep. Wow. But I do remember, uh, I do remember Steve and I were driving across the country we were going to deliver Jean Pierre to Indochina Peace Campaign in California, and we stopped and and met with Judy Danielson and and left the small exhibit that she was going to use with AFSC in Denver, for right. Colorado. Well, we'll hear from Judy in a quick second, but uh, to, to keep moving on here, thank you, Sally, very much. We'll get back to you in a minute, but Jackie, um, you're on. Take it away. Yeah. So a lot of what. Um... Needs to be said, Sally did a very good job on it. Yep. Um, we uh, had also some problems sometimes that I'd like to underscore a little bit. Um, when Don and I were traveling down in the Deep South on two different occasions, um, our, our lives were being threatened. Um, in one case, it was a couple of guys who had said they wanted to work with the project, and it really turned out they wanted to get rid of us. <laughs> and um, that was a, a very dangerous situation. Um, one of the guys tried to, in, in the evening, we were supposed to stay in their, in their uh, house where they were boarding and um i finally woke up and woke up don and said we're getting out of here <laughs> it's too dangerous um the second uh incident happened at a shopping mall we had permission to set up the 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 whole exhibit and then all of a sudden these three men came driving up with guns in the back of their vehicles very large of guns and um they started harassing um uh, uh us um very heavily one of them tried to pull my hair and said that i should get out of here otherwise i might not have any more hair um and uh, luckily there was a policeman standing not too far away and he saw what was happening. He came up and he, he stopped these two characters. But uh, it was very threatening. It was not a nice scene. But um, that those were two incidents that, that um, uh, have, have I keep in my mind all the time because they were they we could have had our lives um, hurt very badly. Um, we also um, tried very hard to meet with people who had never heard very much about um, the whole war in, in Vietnam, in Laos, and Cambodia, uh, mainly because uh, we felt that 
the the three warriors were were all connected and we needed to uh, help everyone in those circumstances so we went to places sometimes that nobody usually visits very much <laughs> and try to talk quietly with people whenever we could and i think that that was a a very important but slightly hidden part of our work um i should also mention that i um was fortunate um to, to be the driver in the cars uh in the car that we were driving and on uh several occasions i got the he the help of um jean um here, who is a young man uh, who lives in the southern part of Missouri, in the deep, deep part. And he has been uh, a finder of some of the pictures you're seeing. Um, and he he's managed to make an entire collection, which I think Sally and I have appreciated very much his, his keeping those for so long for us. Um, you can see also that one of the things that I tried to do was um, to make people feel, to understand the Vietnamese culture, we uh, um, tried to um, have meals that were Vietnamese made. And we had one friend who accompanied us for some time. And then um, we uh, began to cook ourselves. And so the students enjoyed it very much. And they were very, very helpful uh, in many, many occasions uh, of helping us to cook the food and then share it all together. So this was another way of, of approaching um, people's sensitivities um, uh, by not just attacking them, but rather to feed them first and then to show them a movie um, in at the end that would help them understand more about the war. So these were things that we tried to do. And the other point I wanna make is that there were Vietnamese uh, who are coming to the United States and some of them were very, very helpful to our work. Um, we had to keep their names quiet and secret but um, they would talk about what uh, they had experienced. Um, in several of the cases, one of the things I wanna explain is that uh, when we set up the mobile project in a place, um, one of us would always be at the table. And we did this purposefully because there were so many people who would come up and ask questions and they, Many of them were veterans themselves. And what also used to happen very regularly to me is they would come up to me and ask me if I would go and have a cup of coffee with them. At first, I was a little hesitant. Uh, you know, I don't know who these people are. But I, I did finally realize they wanted to talk they realized that we knew something about the war. We weren't just reading it in a newspaper and that um, we had an experience uh, to some degree um, that um, followed their experience. So they would talk with me. Uh, and in one case, it was two, two of them. And we talked for almost three hours they talked to me, telling me what they were feeling and how they were doing. When I got back to the to the, to the area where we had the main exhibit, this woman came up to me and said, did he tell you anything? Did he tell you anything? And I said, excuse me, but what, what would you want him to tell me? Um, no, he's my husband and he won't say a word about what happened. He's frozen, she said. He's frozen out this, and it's hurting him. And that really set me on a track. I would always try to take the time 
to sit at the table and see if anybody came up and wanted to talk in quiet. Uh, but apparently these people felt they could trust me because I had been there. I had seen what they had seen. And I was not happy with what I had seen. So that's well, that. those are my two inputs here. Thank you, Jackie. That's powerful. Very moving. Thank you for sharing that. Let's move to Bob. You have a very unique story here, right, Bob? Yes. Yeah, it, it, it was unique. So uh, when I came home, uh, based, based on what I'd what learned, I learned when I when lived, I in, lived in, uh, I, I wanted to put my experience into some kind of uh, educational context, I guess is the best way to describe it. But I was also concerned with work. Uh, I had some money uh, back pay from my time in captivity. So, but uh, I also had family obligations. So uh, when it came time to figure out what I was gonna do, um, I ended up deciding to go to school in, in, uh, in Berkeley. So uh, <clears throat> before I, traveled with Dave Davis with the Mobile Education Project. Uh, I had traveled with Jackie and Roger for, I think, only a couple weeks in uh, southwestern Oregon and northern California. And as best I can figure it out, it was in August of 73. So because I had spent time uh, when we went back to the White House dinner, myself and, and several other POWs, um, I think it was John Young discovered the Indochina Resource Center, and uh, we ended up spending more time there than anyplace else, I think, during our stay in Washington. So we got to know everybody. Uh, I met Gary Porter and Fred Brantman and Twa and, you know, every everybody that was circulating around in those offices. So after I'd moved to Berkeley, I met uh, Dave Davis, who's on the left in the, the picture. Dave was a... a, a and who just uh, gave a shout out to you, by the way, in the chat. Pardon me? He just gave a shout out to you. Oh, okay. Well, Dave had gone to school with some some friends and they'd made a film about the war in, in Vietnam. Actually, they made a film about the veterans throwing back their medals uh, during the war. So uh, they won a film contest and they got a trip to North Vietnam and they made a film in North Vietnam called The Year of the Tiger. And when the film was still being finished up, I met Dave. I don't remember who introduced me to him, but one of the things he was thinking about doing to help pay for the film and to help promote the film was to travel with the Mobile Education Project. And since I was familiar with it, um, he asked me if I would go with him. And Dave had been in Vietnam for the time that they made the film, but he didn't have uh, any other you know, long-term experience that way. But uh, so I agreed to go. And uh, so we traveled, I think we went to DC and then we traveled uh, in Pennsylvania, upstate New York uh, and Ohio. And I think we were in West Virginia a little bit too. But uh, for me, what Jackie was talking about really hit home because a lot of what I ended up doing was talking in classrooms, whether it was high schools or universities, wherever we had been booked into. So they usually scheduled uh, two or three times a day for classes. And then Dave would uh, show the film and we would talk to people about uh, you know, the content of the film and everything. The film was amazing because they did so much with uh, a limited amount of film and produced something that was uh, very close to, as close as you could get 
to to what it was like on on film, uh, planting rice, doing various things that they that they documented. So uh, I still have a soft spot in my heart for the film. So uh, we finished up, I think, around early December of seventy four. And I, you know, I went home and that was the end of that. But uh, I enjoyed very much doing the mobile education project because like Jackie said, we just went everywhere. We went, to, I think the biggest town we went to before we got to Cleveland was like Binghamton, New York. You know, we were in all these little towns. We had, uh, Remember the van broke down one night. It was Halloween night when we were in Pennsylvania and we were headed. I can't remember where we were headed to in Pennsylvania, but the van broke down and we caught a ride with a, a trucker. He took us to the next town. We got out. We found a little shop that was open. The guy took us back to the car, fixed the car. We were, we were on the road shortly after that. But, you know, you just, uh, you just took it as it came. And I remember cooking a lot. We cooked a lot, but we also, uh, what you had to do if you were cooking for like 150 people, you didn't cook yourself, you organized other people to cook and you just kind of kept an eye on them, make sure they were doing what they needed to do and that everything came together at the same time. So um, it was, to me, it was uh, parallel to the Indochina Peace Campaign Tour because I got to see uh, people who had been anti-war activists while I was a prisoner. And I wanted to know who those people were and you know what they understood about the war. So for me, it was, uh, it was a great experience to travel around the country and I, I always felt like I got as much as I gave in terms of the knowledge that uh, was exchanged. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. So, Judy, you were a grassroots organizer in Colorado and hosted the uh, IME, the project. And tell us about your experiences there. Yes, I was asked to do that and many of you I imagine were organizers too so this will be so familiar but and I wasn't the only one I worked with many uh, talented people and very committed but uh, in Denver we organized many public events and teaching opportunities in the early 70s uh, the arrival of traffic traveling speakers and programs like IMEP was such a great opportunity to broaden our outreach. Clergy and Lady Concerned About Vietnam, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the American Friends, the Unitarians, and especially our wonderful Helen Henry here, were uh, such uh, committed people working together to organize or help with outreach. So when the exhibit came, uh, we found a venue to put it up, to erect the display. I think we did have the small one. Uh, we uh, probably also contacted churches uh, besides universities and places to put this exhibit. We would find a host or host that would house and feed any visitors that came while they were here. We had wonderfully talented artists that designed and created flyers and began publishing a large public gathering, uh, which might include sending information out to the congregations and organizations, sometimes doing a mailing because we didn't have the internet, putting up posters in key spots, getting out word to our media list. In those days, uh, we could call a press conference and reporters from many networks and stations would come. And some would also be willing to do an interview with the speakers for their publication or radio. We would also contact our list of interested high school and college, high school teachers, college professors, offer a guest visitor for their classes. Uh, I remember Jackie arriving 
with the project and helping to cook a Vietnamese fundraising dinner in one of our churches, all of us and many volunteers chopping and stirring. Uh, we had put up the displays there and set out literature, um, also artifacts and things that I had and other people had and they had brought. We had many flyers and books. People had time to browse before and eat, of course, eat dinner before the speaker gave a presentation. And there was always an ask, encouraging people to write or call their members of Congress and ask them to cut funding for the war and to support the pris uh, political prisoners. So the, the education project was a great model. And the project left us recipes we followed with many more such dinners, often in churches. Um, I know Don Luce came through at one point as well and others. I'm not sure if this was connected to the project, but at one point our clergy and lady concern group constructed a small wooden tiger cage. It may not have looked like the cage many have been imprisoned in, but it gave us the chance to point out the cruelty of the imprisonment measures of the Saigon government and U.S. official participation in the torture of Vietnamese civilians. Uh, we had a wonderful 90-year-old volunteer, Helen Langren, who would take her turn sitting in this tiger cage first by the city and county building and eventually on the busy town downtown pedestrian mall. And uh, it really was an opportunity also to talk and share literature with many people who never showed up at a public meeting. So those are just some of our experiences and uh, we appreciated having this project come through very much. Thank you so much, Judy. That's that's great, and it, it uh, comports with a lot of my experience as a, a college student activist from '69, eventually to '74 in Western Massachusetts. And um, I hosted uh, the you know, China Mobile Education Project, a, a modest size exhibit. We set it up in the student union, but we decided to take advantage of it being there for a, a, almost a week to organize a week long series of activities on campus, but took it directly to the community. And I'll just share my screen real briefly here for, if I can figure out where it is. Um, oh boy. All right, so anyway, um, I'm sorry, maybe that didn't work, huh? Okay, so bottom line is, you know, this was in, in uh, February of, uh, uh, of 1974, uh, I work closely with a big cross-section of religious and uh, peace organizations in Western Massachusetts to host the event. We did a week-long um, presentation, a uh, series of, of speakers, including Jean-Pierre Debris, and uh, it was all focused around the political prisoner issue, which at the time, of course, was the real focus politically of the anti-war movement is, is pressing the U.S. government to end military, its uh, support for the police and repressive regimes and in Saigon. And so this poster, of course, was the uh, the illustration of what that was about. And here's a little poster that I think I actually did by hand. If you could look how <laughs> amateurish this is, but we set up the a tiger cage, a mock tiger cage um, outside in the middle of the winter, right at the main intersection where everybody goes through, uh, through town um, and did a 24 hour vigil for a whole week. And we had about 35 different people who each spent time, like your 90-year-old um, friend in Denver, uh, in that tiger cage um, and got tremendous press. We had uh, other speakers other nights of the week, and we ended with a candlelight vigil and potluck dinner at the end of that week. Uh, but this was a way to, at a time when the anti-war movement was waning, uh, to create um, a focus for people of conscience and, and concern <clears throat> to come out and take a stand. Uh, take a shift overnight. Um, and we had some pretty hairy encounters, um, somewhat like what Jackie was describing, where at two in the morning, um, <clears throat> we we had folks uh, come in, you know, pretty ripped guys in terms of too many beers, uh, but literally kick the whole tiger cage down, just destroy it. Um, we were able to, to bring it back within a couple of hours, of course, with some people who were much more skilled with carpentry than me. 
But it was a little scary when you have folks who are totally ripped um, trying to just harass us. Um, so that sort of brought uh, things close, <laughs> a sense of, uh, of danger for, for us college students. Uh, it's, this is real. People take it seriously, and they obviously did. Um, but the bottom line is that the candlelight vigil was a great success the next uh, the Friday night. Uh, we got lots of press coverage. So here are the tiger cages in the background. Uh, they're right there, the main intersection with our signage. And uh, it, <laughs> they made a big deal about it. It was a peaceful vi vigil. That's nice to know. Um, uh, and of course, additional coverage of it the following, uh, you know, that the day it happened. But the week before, the local newspaper nearby North Adams, Massachusetts, uh, used the fact that we were doing this week of activities using the tiger cage and the uh, in the China Mobile Education Project exhibit uh, as a hook for them to talk about, hey, the war needs to come to a close. We are spending all kinds of tax dollars supporting these repressive regimes. And this vigil is something that people ought to pay attention to, come to the programs that we had. So we had over 400 people who, between Jean-Pierre Debris' presentation on one night, AFSC making presentations on other nights, um, and uh, the actual vigil, we had well over 400 people participate uh, that week. And it strategically was important because Western Massachusetts was the home of a moderate member of Congress, Conte, uh, Silvio Conti, Republican, who was in a key position with the House uh, Appropriations Subcommittee for Foreign Operations. So he was absolutely critical as a, um, as a Republican advocate for reducing U.S. military engagement in Southeast Asia. And uh, at one point, after uh, about uh, th four months after the vigil, we got him to sponsor a particular piece of legislation to reduce aid. And when asked uh, by some of his constituents, hey, you ought to get off of that bill. That's not good for our soldier, uh, for uh, you know America to be withdrawing. And he said, my feet are in concrete, set in concrete. I am not backing out of my support for this bill, this amendment to reduce aid. And so um, we sent him concrete. I mean, think about this. Here, he, These are friends of mine sending a 20 pound bag of concrete to reinforce his feet in that concrete so we won't back out of his commitment to uh, sponsor this legislation. And we set up tables at all the campuses in Western Massachusetts, Holyoke and Northampton and Williamstown, Pittsfield. And we, we think there were over 2000 envelopes that had spoonfuls of cement that were mailed to his office. Imagine doing that today, right? Um, that were designed to symbolically reinforce his feet in concrete. He did it and uh, it, he played a very critical role in the legislative efforts uh, in the closing days of the war. So that's my personal experience. I then, end up, then ended up moving to Washington DC upon graduation, worked as, uh, with the coalition to stop funding the war, which became the coalition for new foreign and military policy. Met my wife, got married, moved to Cincinnati. So what a great story that is. All right, moving right along. <laughs> um, uh, thanks. I appreciate that clap there, Willie. Thank you very much. Um, so we're we're getting close to when we need to open this up for everybody else. But uh, this is kind of a lightning round thing. Uh, what lessons, and this would be like 30 seconds, what lessons would each of you, if you'd like to share, um, are, are applicable about what IMEP did that might be uh, something that people might, might want to consider as they do education and organizing work today? If you were talking to a 20 year old activist, what would you tell her that we all did that she and her colleagues might wanna pick up on to be impactful in America? I think one of the big uh, successes from our, both our work and, and the later work of IMEP is telling the real story of what's actually going on because so m there was so much misinformation around the US you know, because the government has the biggest, the loudest voice, I guess. But uh, people who actually have been there, who know what's going on, who can say personally what what happened, they're most the credible people. And I think that was that was yeah. uh, the most important thing for a lot of these these kinds of efforts. Yeah, I I second Willie's idea that. Uh, being able to communicate to people it's yeah we're in the mass media age but you know how, how often do you really have a chance to sit down with people one one on one get to know them a little bit get to know why they think what they think and then if your interest is changing their mind 
you know, how do you go about doing that? I think it's always been the most effective way is always one-on-one -on -one. and to, to be able to hear the voices of people who were there and did it, saw it, pretty hard to top that. Yep, thank you, Bob. And it does matter to people in Congress when they hear from their from their people back home, instead of just lobbyists that are, are on on in Washington. And yep. um, what's his name from West Virginia? I mean, he he was just overwhelmed by the mail coming in from West Virginia. Bird, Senator Bird, and he he was beside himself. What are we going to do? I have all this mail from the Indonesian project. <laughs> he was confused. But Indonesian? He, <laughs> but he, he just couldn't believe the, this yeah. mail coming in. And it made a it. difference. Good. Thank you, Sally. Jackie, and being, you're on mute. Being willing to sacrifice. I mean, like Brewster, I remember knowing about Brewster, you know, basically dropping out of school to do this work. And a lot of people sacrifice in their personal lives to, to be share their passion about this issue. I finally graduated, but <laughs> about time. <laughs> Jackie, were you going to say something? Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to tell the story of, um, uh, it wasn't just me uh, working with the mobile project. It was also uh, a, a the other people I mentioned already, and my late husband, Roger Rump, was very, very critical. First of all, he was six foot five, which meant that he could take those those huge um, pieces of, of wood and put them up here and carry them all the way up three story, stories and, and never, never be uh, falling. Um, Roger was very, very inspirational to uh, many, many people. And Missouri is not the most uh, flamboyant of our country's uh, places. But in Missouri, I can tell you um, that the work that I that he and I have have done in the past um, is very, very recognized by many of the military personnel who live six miles away from our home, because we have the largest air forage space six miles away from our home. And they are very, very conscientious about um, telling us, thank you. And Great. when I go overseas, they take care of my house because they want me to stay there. Excellent. So it, there's you. a re, there is a a rolling stone all the time. Judy, anything to add? Um, I have to agree that one on one is very important, and listening to people that have been there, and I think that uh, is true right now in all the wars the U.S. is very involved in. I am also, I think everyone can be a lobbyist and uh, we should not be afraid to contact con Congress. They they really want to hear from their constituents and we're the ones. And I also think we need to listen to the veterans. Uh, they have uh, really valid experiences and um, so, I hope we continue to do that, but I uh, I agree with everything people have said. Thank you. Well, if I could just add, um, one of the things that was very clear to me is that the IMEP project um, got into so many small communities, as you all have been saying. Uh, we didn't. It wasn't like you know New York City or or Chicago. We were in small towns, and mostly getting into small towns through um, the universities or colleges many of which were religious in, in, uh, in nature, but but also through the religion, the church community. So having the partnership uh, financially and as a fiscal agent with the United Methodist Church immediately gave this project a sense of blessing, I guess, uh, that it must be okay if the National Methodist Church is supporting this project. And uh, so maybe we should host them in our community and give an opportunity for folks from other 
uh, uh, faith traditions to come together in, in our uh, lobby and, and, or over a, a potluck um, and hear what people's experiences were who been there, done that, could bring firsthand uh, knowledge of what was going on in that in those countries uh, to us at the grassroots level. So while demonstrations were still happening and all that, um, this was a way to reach real people um, who may or may not have made their, up their minds about anything. And by the time we were doing this, the neat thing was the vast majority of Americans were against the war and were against U.S. continued funding, continued U.S. To follow funding. Up on, to follow up on your comment, the, the bishop, Methodist bishop of the, the CODIS, Bishop Armstrong invited the mobile project into North and South Dakota. Cool. Speaking of small towns. Yeah, exactly. Well, let me turn it over now to John. John, I know we have some special guests that have just popped up and um, take yeah. it away. All right. Why don't we start with Gene, if you'll unmute yourself. And again, Brewster will continue to be in charge and he'll shut you down if he has to. And then after Gene, Heidi Coglin. Uh, hello, everybody. I had the honor and the privilege of traveling with the IMEP for over a year, most of that time with Jackie and some with Don, some with Twa, and also with John Spragans. And Roger Rumpf also traveled with uh, Jackie and I for a brief period of time. I have many wonderful memories of doing it. I do want to show you a couple of things. This is my picture of Twa that she inscribed on in the back that I am so grateful that I have kept for all those years. Several people talked about political prisoners, and there's one of the buttons that we passed out when we were with it. And I also have the comb that yep. Don has brought me from Vietnam. But the thing that I remember the most about it, other than the camaraderie of all of us that worked on it, were the people in the communities where we went and their dedication. And when we were in Michigan, which is where I first traveled with Jackie in September of 70, no, in July of 72, I bought a little booklet by a well-known artist named Gwen Frostick who did block prints. And I have kept that book. And in it, I kept a list of all of the places we traveled. And I had the people that hosted us sign my book. And I treasure this because these were peace activists. These were people that welcomed us into their home. These were the people that organized in the local communities and helped make our life on the road easier. And I'm so grateful for all of the people that we met, all of the people that we worked with, because they were the backbone of the peace movement and they were the backbone mm -hmm. of ending the war in Vietnam. Certainly the IMEP, the Indochina Resource Center, all of the different organizations played major roles because we organized, we got the word out, we educated. But it was the people in the local communities that were the backbone that changed the public opinion. And I am so grateful for all the people around the country that I met uh, while I got to travel with the IMEP. Also, I then also got to subsequently host it several times in Springfield, Missouri. Willie will appreciate this being at University of Missouri. But uh, we got kicked out of the local shopping mall, but we also got kicked out of Drury College here. And Drury is the only college in the country to have kicked us out. And uh, I have a pretty good history of everything. And I am just tickled to death that I got the opportunity to listen to this webinar and join all of you. And thank you very much for sharing your stories. Well, Gene, it's wonderful to have you with us. What a great history. And, and uh, you bringing that perspective from a, a long time on the road. Oh, my God crazy so thank you it was and it was wonderful i am going to share one other thing my wife and i have now been together for 42 years she was a nurse in vietnam and that was an experience that had a profound impact on her also and so we we subsequent to that we've been members of peace network of the ozarks been involved in disability rights and other progressive organizations and continued on the good fight thanks for all you do Thank you. All. Grateful. So, Heidi, welcome. Tell us your story. You're on mute. From New Zealand, no less. Whoa. Yeah. Are you in New Zealand now? Uh, you're on mute, though, Heidi. Hey, can I say something real quick since Heidi's joined us? Heidi was here with Jocelyn Bolin when they got kicked out of Drury University. 
I hosted that and they got kicked out. And, and so we'll see, Heidi, if you could put yourself, uh, well, turn off your mute there. And John, uh, I, I see that people have raised their hands or some folks, uh, and I'm sure you're monitoring that, so. We have a lot of questions to go to, so. Okay, so what? Why don't we do that? Heidi, keep working on it and we'll bring you in as soon as uh, you're off mute. <laughs> John, go ahead. All right. Um, we have a, a question from Dan. Excuse me, I have to move that screen over to, so I can see them. Um, Gloria Switzer asked the last name of Helen, your 90 year old volunteer. Do you know that? Oh. Helen Lingren. Helen Lingren. Lingren, thank you. Um, Mary McDonnell asks, how would you assess the impact of the IMEP on ending the war, anecdotally based on reactions of the people you interacted with? No. Anybody? Well, Heidi is ready. I think Heidi was Heidi with the orphan orphan plane. Do I remember that? Oh, wait, Social answer. worker in Vietnam. Wait, Heidi, are you going to speak now? We we're still not hearing you. You're not muted, but we're not hearing you at all. All right, see if nope. you can maybe go off and come back on or something, or maybe your computer. Look at the. Uh, something on your computer, you may have to fix the microphone. At any rate, back to Mary's question, the actual impact of IMEP, you discussed that in broad terms, but whether there are any anecdotes where you had reactions from people that you saw directly contributing to the end of the war. Anybody wanna pick that up? Well, I would. I was uh, when when Brewster mentioned uh, the Congress action. I think Gene Stolzfus went with Bella Abzug and a group of Congress people to Vietnam. Yeah, and they came back and passed a bill to to stop the funding for the war, if I remember correctly. Yeah, huge impact. Huge. I don't well, remember the dates when that was exactly, but I know Gene, it was. It was a group that went there with Gene, and he was a translator and also organized a bunch of meetings and with other with real people in Vietnam. And I think mm -hmm. it was the it was the spring just before the money was cut. So that would have been seventy five, right? Yeah, Jackie, you're on mute. Uh, okay, Brewster, you probably remember well our long nights of licking. Um, letters and sending them all over the country to these lists of people that we had. And I can Thank remember- Thank you for your help on that. Thank you for your help. With that. <laughs> Our mailing parties. <laughs> Our mailing parties, huge. Lots of beer and pizza. Yep, go ahead. Uh -huh. And and then shortly after that, um, Ed Snyder, uh, who works with the um, Quakers, at that time, he took me uh, by the hand and led me to every single um, uh, person that he knew, which he knows a lot of uh, people uh, on the Hill and had me talk to them. Um, that was the day before the final vote. Then we went upstairs to the third floor and we watched and waited and waited until about 3 a.m. in the morning. And finally, the vote came through and it cut the funding to Nguyen Van Chu. And it was extremely close. I and think we won by six, six votes. Six but, votes. Go ahead. Go ahead. We I are going to come back to that topic in another webinar. So uh, we'll put that aside for now. Heidi, are you able to speak? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. perfect. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> right. Very quickly, I'll just um, introduce. I um, was with AFSC in Vietnam as a physiotherapist, and 
came back to the States after my two year um, contract with them in January, in, in February of 1975. And not having anything else to do, I was approached by Sally to see that if I would join IMEP and if I knew anybody who would also like to partner with me. So the only people I knew were two that I had met in Vietnam who were working with the um, Commonwealth Quaker group in Saigon, sometimes known, um, oh, I can't remember, but anyway, um, I had got to know them well. And that was um, uh, Jocelyn Bowden, um, later Bowling, and Helen Stevens. The Helen was from Scotland and Jocelyn was from oh. Australia. So they both came and joined me. Um, I did want to talk about a little bit about, because we were late in the war, um, I think there was a lot more acceptance of our, um, our message, especially to Rotaries um, and those community groups, um, other than then getting caught, uh, kicked out of the college so much for freedom of speech. Um, but generally, people were war weary, and there had been so much information imparted around that they were generally much more accepting. Didn't mean that we didn't have any dangerous times um, where people got quite irate in shopping centers. But I think the last thing I really wanted to um, of the uh, uh, to talk about was uh, Helen and I were on Talkback Radio on April 30th, 1975. And people were invited to call in and make comments or ask questions. We were in a sound booth. The latest news would be written on a piece of paper and plastered against the, the glass so we could read the latest news of what was happening with um, the um, the army, North Vietnamese army entering into Saigon. And then we were asked to comment on it. Generally, the feedback that came in from people was that they were so glad that the war was over. But I do remember one person still very, very angry who rang in and said, the answer to the Vietnam War was to put all the Vietnamese in little boats out in the South China Sea and drop an atom bomb on them. So <laughs> um, that really, really stuck with me. Um, the other um, thing that I wanted to mention was that with the war being over, um, we changed our um, a lot of our emphasis on amnesty for draft dodgers. And I was mm -hmm. partnered with a draft dodger and I've been trying and trying to remember his name, but I want to give um, credit to him. He took quite a bit of flack, but we carried on and um, he really represented his group. We also changed the topic more to um, United States responsibility in reconstruction um, in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'll leave it to others. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, John. All right. We have David Marr. I don't, we had David yes. Marr, Robert Minnick. Um, can you, I, can, you can, we yeah, can at I, least hear I, you, Robert. I thought we had your picture, but. Yeah. Can you have, can you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. Right. I, um, so I, I can see you. Uh, um, I, I just wanted to um, uh, connect what we did at the Indochina Resource Center, where, where Don actually was the co-director with, with me, um, and uh, how we cooperated. Um, uh, I think one of the most important elements was the the, um, the information transmission. We, um, we, we had John Spragans in Saigon, and uh, after he left, several others helping us, and they were transmitting information on an almost, <clears throat> excuse me, daily basis. Um, and what was really uh, interesting uh, is that um, 
it was able to go via the Armed Forces uh, Postal Service um, be because the journalists were all, all accredited uh, through that basis. Of course, I don't know to what degree the, the, the material was viewed on, on the way over, but it got to us and we then distributed things to, to Don uh, as, wherever he was located. Um, the other connection of course was Congress. And um, as he went from one congressional district to another, uh, sending information uh, back and forth uh, from the uh, from the member of Congress uh, to to him. Uh, so that sort of interaction, I think, was quite important throughout that uh, four year period. That's it. David you, Marr from Australia. Yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah, the Indochina Resource Center had one room, and the next door was. I met with one room with three desks and a bed and a day bed. And it's just amazing that the ambassador said that spread, meaning the Indochina Resource Center, and Don, meaning Mobile Project, <laughs> kept him from winning the war. I mean, that's just <laughs> stunning. And a great tribute to the movement that the ambassador never understood. Exactly. John? David seems to be going on and off. I, I don't know if we've got some trans-Pacific. Um... Yeah, I'm still here, if you can hear All right, me. okay, go ahead. No, I don't have nothing more. I'm just, the interaction uh, with uh, the uh, IMEP as it moved from one location to another, of course, was it was quite interesting sometimes, but uh, it, it turned out to be extremely valuable. Great. A um, couple of other questions. Uh, Sally, somebody was asking when the office was bombed, the office which was also your house, uh, and whether you ever found out who was responsible. It was not our house. It was the the... The IMF office became, Don's insistent, became a calc office. It was one room and it, it was um, June 30th, I think, 19, it was my parents-in-law's 50th wedding anniversary. Um, what was the year? It, it would have been 1980. It would have been June of 1980. And what had happened was we had, we had a young intern in the summer who had gone through all the material and helped defile the publicity material, the personnel material, the newspaper articles, the whole history of Mobile Project. We didn't spend the money to get a metal file cabinet. We we bought a cardboard cardboard drawers, uh, file drawers. And put them in the up in the closet right inside the door, and that's how they all got destroyed. And what happened was, uh, there were some Palestine groups in the building, um, who somebody with that took credit. It thought it said that it was they were the ones who were the target, but that, that was not true because we had clergy and laity concerned, plastered on the door, clearly. But that week before, there were people from the Mid-Atlantic Calc uh, projects who had done some demonstrating at the Pentagon. And it was also a period when several other anti-war uh, groups were getting attacked. And I we don't know who did it, but it was devastating. I think Bob Minnick is ready, looks like. He's spoken already. I want to. I have questions that I need to ask from people. When so no, John I, I, Kim asked, no, John, I, 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 John, he has not spoken yet. Bob ha, has spoke. Yes, I have done. No, you haven't. I thought you no. did. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, Bob you had spoken. Bob and Don Luce went out in the very first uh, van out of Washington to York, Pennsylvania, and the King of Prussia Mall. And on, so Bob. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, we did. 
and uh, we we started up at Cornell when we when we in Ithaca, New York, when we put it all together and put it on the back of a VW van and King of Prussia, York, Pennsylvania. We also went to Vermont, uh, where Don Luce is from. I was with Don and Stolzers was kind of organizing stuff for us. Maybe Willie Myers, I don't even know that for sure, but it was being organized. No, I, was, I was not there. I just gotta say, I'm so sorry that Don Luce is not here and Gene Stolzers is not here. They died too young. <laughs> they died too young, yeah. But when we were in Vermont, it was so great because uh, many in this uh, talk have said, hey, have you been to Vietnam? And they, they say, well, I give you some credibility. Well, in Vermont, it didn't give you credibility, but Don Luce was from Vermont. So they'd say, are you a Vermonter, Don? And he said, yeah. And so they really listened to him. And uh, that, was, that was really important. And, and in uh, King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, one thing that happened they, somebody who was very aggressive came up and said, where the hell is Indochina? I never heard of Indochina. Um, <laughs> so that happened, uh, that was one of the things. But I just wanted to give a little lightness to it all, but thank you all for your input. I've learned a lot of stuff about MF that I didn't even know, even though I was part of it. So thank you for this. Thank you. Sorry, Bob. I had thought before you had spoken before David Marr. It must have been somebody else at that point. A um, couple of quick questions, because we're now almost at 8.30. Um, John Kim asked who you contacted in general to set up an event in a city or town you weren't familiar with. Bob or... Jackie, do you want to speak to that? Or I don't know if it was being done from the national office by Sally, or how did you do that? You're on mute, Sally. How, how did we... The national office was one room, um, three beds and a day bed. But yes, we would, we would contact ch uh, university chaplains, college chaplains, uh, council of churches, AFSC regional offices, uh, brethren, and Mennonite group. I mean, just any any organization that we knew about that had concerns about the war, and they almost always stepped up to do major organizing. And remember, Does that you could the person's question. You couldn't do it by email. No, it was all by phone. No text messages landline and, and mail and big phone and bills worked. big phone bills um dan wesner had a important question which was what the single most important lesson did the vietnamese people impress upon imep for its mission in the states uh, i don't know whether willie or which of you would like to uh Jackie put her hand up. Let Jackie. me say, I, I think that the idea of the poetry book, which was Don's, Don Luce and um, Gene Stolzis's idea, uh, as far as John I know. John Schaefer. John and Schaefer. John Schaefer. So, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, John Schaefer. Um, I think that was an unusual tool for us because... Um, when we were speaking with an audience, um, Don would always ask me, and now I want to have Jackie read some poetry to you. And I would read some of the poems that were that children and adults had written, um, uh, Vietnamese, that is, had written and had given to Don. They were spectacularly important in my mind. So that's why we produced a second book uh, uh, later on. And I think for the Vietnamese, poetry is something extremely important in their culture. And they talk about it. I'll give you one example of where, uh, at one point I had a large group of Vietnamese from Vietnam who didn't like the fact that we were talking um, about uh, stopping the war. And um, I decided that the only way I was going to get through to them was to talk about poet poetry. And it worked. 
they calm down. And then they John, find- can you show my picture? I want to show this. John? Oh, yeah. yeah. You're okay. Yeah, so this is one of the books. And yeah. um, these these books had, these are poems written by Vietnamese. Some are children's poems, some are adult poems, some are, uh, are uh, just collected from various sources. Um, and that, these poems uh, are, in, someone told me, are still selling on the internet. Yeah, they are. They are. So it's it was it turned out to be a remarkable tool. Um, when Don asked me if I would help him to to make this booklet of, of poems with John, and I said, Don, Don, I've never written a poem in my life. <laughs> and he said, You can do it. And he would push me all the way. <laughs> so you've got to do it. <laughs> well, folks, uh, those one may of the not many things. Those may not one be of the many. The kind of lessons that Dan was looking at, but it certainly was a fascinating one. Yeah, Brewster, why don't you close it yeah, and I'm then sorry. I'll have some final announcements. Sally, to make some. Yeah, Sally, go ahead and finish your thought there, Sally. Oh, just that there were a number of things like this in the, in the prayer book and a number of things that we actually published as the Indochina Resource also published yeah. a lot of the material that we took around with us. Great. Good point. Good point. Well, I, on behalf of all the panelists, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to listen. We had a, a really good turnout today and uh, not much drop off as the program went on. And I just really appreciate all of you folks as panelists for sharing your experiences and your insight and uh, your, your commitment to doing good work in the world. And um, it's fun to be with you all and to capture this for history. Frankly, that's an important piece of what we're trying to do with the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. So back to you, John. Okay, there are a couple of questions we didn't get to and we'll try and send emails to the people who asked them. The questions and the chat will be available to everybody as will on YouTube, the video of this program. Hopefully, I this is always uh, stretches my technical capabilities, but hopefully it'll be up on YouTube by tomorrow and you will get a note by tomorrow after afternoon or evening that will give you the YouTube link. Um, one commercial notice or two commercial notices. One is that while nobody who did this is receiving any kind of honorarium or payment, there are real costs. We uh, have to pay the Zoom people and other pe folks for for doing this. And uh, so you're will in the follow-up note we send out there will be a link for donations and we would be much appreciative of them they're tax deductible so whatever you can do um finally if you see our newsletter you notice that we yeah. are all concerned about what ought to be done uh, for the in, indochina resource center and everybody yeah like like a couple of weeks ago yeah. uh david mute yeah. yourself <laughs> Oh, sorry, I'm supposed to be off. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. At any rate, uh, you see uh, that this we're coming on the 50th anniversary of the end of the war, and we're encouraging as much stuff to happen locally and nationally as possible. And for people who've never been to Indochina or are ready to make a return trip, we will be doing a program the last couple of weeks of April that will end up in Ho Chi Minh City for the immense celebration that that they hold every five years uh, for the, they characterize it more for the reunification of the country, uh, but for both for peace and the reunification of the country. So you should all be on the newsletter list. And if you're interested, just send us a note. So Brewster, thank you for moderating. To all the panelists, thank you for your contribution. Oh, somebody asked us, uh, Susan Hammond of the War Legacies Project asked whether anyone has written a book to put this whole history together. Um, I'm afraid the answer is no. There is a book about international voluntary services, but there's not one about IMEP, but maybe this, uh, 
webinar will inspire somebody immediately or some graduate student five years from now to, to do that book because it would be wonderful to do it. Thank you again all very much. And we will, I don't know what our next program will be, whether it'll be about this coalition to stop funding the war or somebody's come up with an interesting idea of a program for the legal work that was done in support of military people in Europe and in the US. So, so we may go to that direction, but we will let everybody- you know, Jean-Pierre, Jean-Pierre Debris might be interested in helping us with a particular program on the political prisoner situation. All right, yeah, we will be doing a program on the third force and the political prisoners, but that's not been scheduled yet. All right, bye everybody, be well. Thank you all. Bye. Heidi, I, Heidi, I hope you, I can get your email from John. It's all, yeah, we can provide it to everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.